Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student uh, Christian Movement. Uh, before we start this uh, webinar, just want to uh, acknowledge the lands on which uh, we are meeting and we're all kind of scattered uh, today and want to acknowledge uh, Elders past, present and emerging and a particular acknowledgement of uh, members of the Indigenous community that identify as queer. Now this webinar has three parts to it. One is to kind of hear about some of the hurt and obviously it's just a small uh, part of, of the hurt caused by uh, the discrimination and the lack of inclusiveness and the lack of uh, genuine welcome uh, by churches, to hear some of the theological justifications for that, uh, that, that discrimination, not that it's right, but just you know, what does the church use to say that you're not welcome here? And also to talk, and most importantly, how do we make the church more inclusive, affirming, so not the disingenuous hospitality that you're welcome to come to our church, we'll be nice to you, we'll give you tea and coffee, but we don't approve of how you live and who you really are and we don't want you being a youth minister and we, uh, we're going to condemn you from the pulpit. So, but a genuine affirming church, how do we make that happen? So if we can start with Geordie, who will share uh, the negative experience that uh, people have had. Yeah, no, thank you, David. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's Geordie. My pronouns are they, them. I'm currently the National Queer slash LGBTQI plus officer for the National Union of Students. Um, I thought I'd start today um, as it's been a very big prevalent topic recently in Australia um, about the banning of conversion practices um, so con content warning for those, I do discuss about the story of an individual who has experienced conversion practices. Um, I say practices instead of therapy because uh, conversion is not a therapeutic service at all. Um, and matter of fact is it, this story that I'm providing is from an individual who has had um, horrific um, experiences and has thankfully um, open up their story because of how important it is to ban conversion practices within both the state and national level. Um, so the story is of um, Erin E. Jerez um, and their experiences with uh, conversion practices. Um, so I'll go and start. So basically, um, a young girl sits waiting in hope that the demons will leave her body. She wants to be free from her sins um, and through prayer and holy water, attempts are made to get rid of her evil spirits. By the age of 21, um, this Tasmanian has gone through five exorcisms, some lasting multiple days. Some of the quotes she's mentioned um, about this is said, I had Satan in me, so the exorcisms were to cast these demons out. I was told that I had demons inside of me, the spirits of lesbianism, and, but I didn't want to be gay. So of course I went along with it. Um, so basically Irene grew up in a loud Greek household um, and she always felt like she was the odd one out. She often scolded, was often scolded by her family for not fitting into the expected gender role um, that she was labeled as a tomboy. This all changed when Ernie's friend invited her to attend church with her family. So taking her in as their own, um, this new family treated her as their daughter. And for the first time in her life, Ernie felt accepted. But this acceptance she had long craved was short lived um, as the family's stance on homosexuality was clear. Ernie had to stop being gay. The new family promised to help change her sexual identity. And with their support, this is when Erinie's journey of exorcism, prayers and counselling began. So, um, uh, and then basically, but after years of failed conversion um, therapy um, is what she said, but as I mentioned, we call it conversion practices. It was suggested that Erinie went to a place called Mercy Ministries. The people around Erinie, who she loved and trusted, told her to go because this place could fix her. She left Tasmania to join a place called Mercy Ministries without her parents' knowledge. 
and it, it was a decision that would change Ernie's life forever. Something she was quoted saying is, for nine months, I was isolated in a place where same-sex attraction was treated as though it was a mental illness. My treatment was to get God in and gay out, um, she said. On, on the website of Mercy Ministries, it says that it treated women aged 16 to 28 years old by providing homes and care for young women suffering the effects of eating disorders, self-harm, abuse, depression, unplanned pregnancies, and other life-controlling issues. Um, some former clients of Mercy Ministries claim that they were denied professional help and were instead exercised and told simply to repent their sins. Um, there has been bad publicity and an investigation by the ACCC forcing the closure of controversial counselling program that was linked to the Evangelical Hillsong Church. Um, so what Ernie says is it was kind of a cross between the army, a psych ward and a convent. There's a big group of women out there that are still healing from this day. She said that there still has repetitive nightmares about it to this day, years later. They, they made us march around the pyramid over the block every morning, confessing out loud our sins and all the evil that would led into our lives. They made us believe that we were actually chosen to be gay and it was a di direct result of our fathers not hugging us enough when we were little and from listening to Kitty Lang in the 90s, along with equally other absurd theories. Being one of the few people to graduate, Erin says she was healed of her lesbianism. But alas, all her work had, and said that alas, all her work had paid off and that she's not queer anymore. I'm normal, I'm not disgusting. But it did not take long for her to realize nothing had changed and she was still same sex attraction. For Erin, this felt like the ultimate failure. But Erin went through around five years of conversion therapy. And she said the following, I think we've had, we've lost enough people of, faith, uh, our, of our people to this. And those that, of us that do survive have a hell of a time, a hell of a journey to try and heal, she says. Your sexuality or gender identity should be as unimportant as your eye color, it doesn't matter. Um, and the daunting thing is, is, she said, this is still happening. Three states and territories have passed legislation recently banning conversion practices in Victoria, Queensland, and the ACT. And legislation has been proposed in other states. Um, the recent Tasmanian Law or Reform Institute has suggested reforms to Tasmania's laws around conversion practices in which um, the Tasmanian government has recently said that they will introduce legislation to ban this practice. Um, <clears throat> this sort of proposal has been welcomed by Erin, who has joined the fight to change Tasmania's law around the type of therapy. And she said that, I'm shocked that this is still happening in my lifetime. It belongs in the dark ages and it's horrifying. So basically what, Erity has said is essentially she's talked about her experiences within um, the church and how um, conversion practices have essentially created this damaged image that she's not who she is um, and that it's sinful to be a homosexual. Um, it's unfortunate that this is the case or has been the case um, and I do want to say that obviously this doesn't reflect the entire church as a whole um, it doesn't reflect a lot of institutions out there that are obviously um, promoting um, po like positive representation and actually trying to be there for the LGBTQ plus community. But as demonstrated um, by the charts today, um, we are talking about the ongoing discrimination or that has been occurring and um, why it needs to be addressed. And I thought today is a pivotal time to ensure that we could talk about the story of individuals like Erony, um, because it really does matter. Um, and it's really, um, it's like really moving to see Erony being willing to come out and talk about these discussions because of the hurt, especially with the hurt that they've experienced. So yeah, that's um, that story today and um, thank you again for allowing the chance to for me to talk about it uh, today David through this webinar.
Thank you, Geordie, for uh, sharing uh, her story. Did anyone want to comment on, on, on what they heard? Okay, that's okay. But there, there's an opportunity there if you if you do later on want to say something because it is such a powerful story. And so please feel free to, to share something either uh, verbally or in the comment section. So now I, I want to sort of preface what I'm about to say trying to preempt what other people say, which is that, oh no, here we go. You are going to just sort of um, pick and choose from the Bible. You're going to make the Bible fit your view. So if we want to be inclusive, you're just going to, you know, find things that are inclusive. I want to point out that everybody interprets things the way that they want, even the people that are critical of doing that. Uh, for example, and it's not just with religion, you know, for example, with free speech, should it cover everything? What are the restrictions? The right to bear arms, we're seeing that play out in the United States. Does that mean no restrictions? What type of restrictions does it mean? And in the Bible, you know, thou shalt you know, love thy enemies. Now, for some people, uh, that means not going to war and never killing somebody. For other people, it means, well, you can have a just war and you can kill people and you know, things like that in, in certain circumstances. So we interpret what we want. So one argument, and you're free to disagree with this, is why not interpret it in a more supportive, inclusive way? And it's a good thing that people do pick and choose uh, because otherwise you're in trouble. Because if you go through the Bible, um, there is, of course, a lot of things in there. And, and I'll just bring up a few or mention a few. Um, this is from Leviticus. Uh, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Now, not even hardliners in Australia, or at least some of them, uh, believe that people should be executed uh, for being gay. So they're already trying to reinterpret things, which is a good thing. So why not just go that one step further and say, if you've got a choice between a faith that is loving and inclusive, versus a faith that isn't, and you have that autonomy to, to interpret it different ways, why not lean towards the more loving one? Because that's one you can argue. And of course, there's other things in there as well. And this is from Paul. The women should keep silence in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but sh should be subordinate. As even the law says, if there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And again, people, including people who are critical of picking and choosing, will say, well, it doesn't actually mean women have to be quiet. It doesn't actually mean women have to ask their husbands. So we do uh, pick and choose, and, and uh, that's not an issue. Then you've got one from Deuteronomy, chapter 25, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his brother who is dead, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now, most people, um, conservative or liberal, do not think that uh, if somebody dies, the brother has to marry um, the widow and call the son after the brother that has passed away. And then, of course, you've got something in here that says a man from Leviticus, a man or woman who is a medium or a wizard shall be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Now, again, most people don't think that um, a, a psychic should be uh, stoned to death. And then, of course, there's something here for business people, again, from Leviticus, you shall not lend him your money at interest nor give him your food for profit. Most people, conservative or not, um, don't seem to have a problem with banks charging interest if they're the ones owning the bank. They don't have a problem with restaurants uh, charging, putting the price of food at, at, at above the cost of that food to the business. Um, so again, if you're going to pick and choose, why don't they pick and choose something good, um, inclusive? So can we now please hear from Bridge? Awesome, thank you. Um, that was that was yeah really really interesting to sort of hear that kind of interpretation on some of those verses. Um, 
Yeah, I was essentially, and I'm really glad that you started off earlier, David, kind of talking about that sort of difference between acceptance and affirmation or like true kind of like welcoming rather than just sort of like that superficial welcoming where people are, you know, free to come and join, have their cup of coffee um, and like not sort of, I guess, you know, get involved in ways that they're wanting to or, um, yeah, like fully sort of becoming part of the community in a way that they might be able to if they had a different identity. Um, what I was going to talk about kind of related to that, um, I'm going to start off with um, a bit of a story from a man called, uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, Josh Canfield. And this was a story that I actually found through a site called Church Clarity, who are a, um, like a crowdsourced database of um, Christian congregations who make their, um, their actively enforced policy really obvious online and their stances around queer people and women um, in leadership are really obvious. Um, and it's kind of a website that's designed to sort of compile that information in a way that's really easy for people to find if they're looking for faith communities where they can go and um, sort of expect to be fully involved. Um, and it's just sort of in, um, been set up in the interest of kind of, as it says, increasing that clarity around um, people sort of knowing what kind of community they're going to be engaging with before they do. Um, so Josh Canfield was a, um, a choir leader with um, the Hillsong Church in New York and um, actually took part in um, Survivor, like the reality show, and during that came out as gay, let people know that he had had a boyfriend for some time and um, subsequently was asked to step down from his position um, as a choir director. And um, there's a really, really good interview with him on that website that I very highly recommend. And he's sort of talked a fair bit about his experience of kind of getting involved with um, his church on the proviso that he, um, they sort of made a lot of like broad sweeping kind of claims, like people are accepted here regardless of identity. We accept everyone. Um, and finding out that that was not necessarily the case um, in practice. But I am just going to read um, a tiny bit of, there was a question in this interview where he was asked about um, how this kind of impacted his relationship with God and with the church. And in response, Josh said, it was extremely difficult to keep getting pushed to the sidelines without anyone telling me exactly why. Everyone in the church leadership knew that I was gay and dating, and it wasn't an issue until Brian Houston made his statement. That statement was around um, sort of full acceptance of um, people regardless of identity. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, it wasn't an issue until Brian Houston made his statement that I wasn't a choir leader at church and they don't approve of homosexuality. Um, no statement ever made at Hillsong London or Hillsong NYC, which I attended for almost eight years, that they believed being in a committed relationship with someone of the same sex was wrong or a problem. In fact, the only time I heard the word gay from the main stages was when it was grouped together with other minorities like the Black community or refugees. This lack of clarity on what the church believed hurt my relationship with the church because I began not trusting people. I would doubt things that they said to me and wondered if they were ever speaking truthfully. Um, thankfully, my relationship with God was not damaged to a large degree. I kept falling back on him and he always caught me. I knew God loved me and created me as a gay man. And yeah, I just think that's, um, yeah, really important to kind of hear from people who are sort of in that kind of space where they have been accepted to some degree and been able to sort of go and get involved and gain some of the really positive aspects out of finding um, a community where they can freely practice, practice their faith, but are still sort of having that um, kind of caveat, I guess, placed on them based on their identity. Um, and yeah, just briefly, it's sort of um, my experience as well with um, the church has sort of been along similar lines. I was... Um, uh, sent to a Catholic school uh, 
um, for my primary schooling, um, not because my parents were Catholic, but because that was the school that was available where we were. Um, and sort of any questions around queer identity at that point um, were very sort of actively shut down. And it was sort of very much a culture of just, we don't even talk about it. Like we, we don't, and even just sort of like other aspects of diversity, it just kind of didn't come up um, and any sort of questions or conversations around it were quite actively shut down. So I didn't sort of began like begin exploring my identity or anything like that, or really sort of having those questions about queerness or gender come up at that point. Um, and potentially if we'd sort of had an environment where those conversations were a bit more okay, I could have um, had those questions come up and gotten some answers a bit earlier than I did. Um, but I, yeah, then um, began homeschooling at the end of primary school while my mother was um, completing her Bishop's Certificate of Ministry with the Anglican Church um, at the same time as homeschooling me. And she's, um, she sort of came to her faith quite late in life, um, actually upon me going to Catholic school and her getting involved with the church that way. Um, but she ended up having some sort of concerns with the with the Catholic Church around um, she my mother's a pretty hardcore feminist and sort of asked a lot of questions around women in leadership and around sort of particular things that that she was being told were expected of women and at the time she was engaged um, to a man who she was living with and was approached by several different people in the church to sort of suggest that this wasn't acceptable um, and all of these kinds of things. And so we, that was around the time that we ended up making the switch to the Anglican church um, where she found a really, really um, amazing community that has really helped her and she's fully gotten involved. Um, and she's always been my biggest ally and always like really, really advocated for me and my identity. Um, but my sort of experiences with her church um, as I've kind of gotten older and come out has been very much that one of um, acceptance but not affirmation, I think. Like, it's sort of one of those things that it's, I'm very, very welcome if I ever want to go there, if I ever want to participate, um, that's all totally fine. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where, it's just best if I sort of don't talk about my identity there, don't kind of ask questions, um, don't sort of engage in any sort of discussion around it. And um, in particular, I just sort of, um, sort of being in that environment vicariously while going through the marriage equality debate about five years ago um, was a really interesting one where I was sort of hearing from people like members of her congregation, including their priest who was dealing with a lot of, um, like giving a lot of sort of advice and helping a lot of people through that period who were unsure about what, what the sort of beliefs of the church were around that and how they should be voting. So a lot of people were coming for sort of guidance around that vote. Um, and the priest sort of having to say like, look, I personally don't have any issues with it, but, um, and I can't tell you how to vote, um, but either way, the church probably still isn't going to be able to recognise these marriages, just so that you know that. And that has been the case um, from what I believe. And it's sort of become a thing now that, like, anytime I sort of am having conversations with this priest for longer than about 15 minutes, it will somehow come back to the fact that, you know, like so many members of her congregation voted yes so many people are accepting of um queer relationships and having those people in their congregation but they're still unable to perform marriages um under their diocese and there's yeah a lot of things kind of going on there that sort of still kind of give that message of like yes you're welcome but you're not going to be fully affirmed or included here so yeah that was that was all I kind of wanted to share at this point. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for sharing that. Did anyone have any uh, comments? Did they want to add to that, uh, Geordie or anyone else?
I should also mention it's 30 years um, since uh, women were allowed to be priests in the Anglican Church. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, Jordi, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's all right. Um, no, I think Bridge, like what they've discussed is very relevant um, about the fact that there is acceptance, but there's not necessary um, affirming, uh, like churches don't affirm people. Um, like I've come to, like I've gone to church services in the past where essentially the idea, like they've gone with similar messaging saying you're accepted for who you are but like they um, don't necessarily take a stance on particular issues or don't really voice their own concerns. Um, I think one of the churches that I really recognize or really appreciate, to be honest, um, in general, um, is the Uniting Church overall um, and their stances and how they proactively take a stance on, for instance, issues around refugee rights, because it's a human rights issue. Um, and also like they've taken up um they're always willing to voice their concerns around any matters around religious discrimination and such so when the federal religious discrimination bill was being debated earlier this year um which thankfully is now like it's been shelved and it's not <laughs> it is coming back but like there hopefully is going to be better precautions around the wording and what it does as around the issues around LGBTQ plus communities. Um, but like, yeah, I think it's really important that the church, churches recognize that they are an institution. Um, they do have power and influence where possible. Like if they're willing to go and say, like on a matter, like and make submissions to parliaments, et cetera, about specific issues, they should proactively still be willing to affirm people's identities or be willing to openly state that, yeah, we are willing to support this community um, and willing to take the, like, and stand up for it. So, yeah, I think um, <laughs> that's a lot, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing. Uh, and if anyone does think of a, a question or wants to make a comment, please do in the comment section or, or out loud, whatever works for you. I wanted to focus now on Sodom and Gomorrah because it's probably the, arguably the, the most well-known part of the Bible used uh, against people who identify um, as, as being part of the queer community. In fact, it's built into the language. You know, the, the word sodomy comes from this from Sodom, the, this city I mentioned in the Old Testament. So I'll just read part of the story just to kind of give uh, the context. Uh, the evening, the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting there, and when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Then he welcomed them and bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, come to my home to wash your feet and be my guest for the night. You may then get up early in the morning and be on your way again. Oh, no, they replied, we'll just spend the night out here in the city square. But Lot insisted. So at last they went home with him. Lot prepared a feast for them, complete with fresh bread made without yeast, and they ate. But before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city and surrounded the house. They shouted to Lot, where are the men who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. So Lot stepped out to talk to them, shutting the door behind him. Please, my brothers, he begged, don't do such a wicked thing. Look, I have two virgin daughters. Let me bring them out to you and you can do with them as you wish. But please leave these men alone for they are my guests and are under my protection. Stand back, they shouted. This fellow came to town as an outsider and now he's acting like our judge. We'll treat you far worse than those other men. And they lunged toward Lot to break down the door, but the two angels reached out, pulled Lot into the house and bolted the door. Then they blinded all the men, young and old, who were at the door of the house. So they gave up trying to get inside. Now this is used to say that God doesn't like homosexuals and he destroyed two cities. Um, as a result of that. Apparently giving up your two daughters to a, to, a, to a group of men outside is okay, but people had a big issue with, you know, the homosexuality and growing up, whenever I would hear televangelists, they always referenced the story and they always said, this is why these two cities were destroyed. Uh, interestingly, in Ezekiel, 
they mention, it mentions, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. So a more, whatever term you want to use, progressive term, a progressive view is that the reason these cities were destroyed is because people neglected the poor and because they were arrogant and overfed and unconcerned. And I suppose, and this is just my opinion and you can disagree with me, I can see why people said, well, look here, we can either say it was destroyed because there were people who were gay and if I'm not gay, then I'm okay. But if you accept it, well, actually it was destroyed because people were arrogant and overfed and unconcerned. That's, you can't distance yourself from that because you can say, well, actually, look at how many calories I have compared to somebody who lives in a poorer country. Look at uh, how much I have compared to somebody else. Look at the poor and the needy and what I have and I should be doing more. So I'm not surprised people said, look, if we're gonna tell this story, how about we focus on the fact that it was because they were gay why we did something, why God did something rather than because we were greedy and, and overfed and unconcerned because then we might have to go, well, actually that kind of describes us compared to those of us that are doing it uh, tougher. What do you all think about Sodom and Gomorrah? What was your understanding of it? What's your kind of reflections on it? Rich, did you have a, sorry to put you on the spot. I have never really learned very much about it sort of beyond, I guess, just the sort of thing of like, that's why God hates gay people. <laughs> um, that's the only way that I'd ever sort of heard it brought up before. But I think that's really interesting that sort of like holding on to that area that people can use to distance themselves from that so that it automatically won't apply to them um it's yeah really really interesting definitely learned something new from that geordie did you have anything to say i'm, I'm hesitant to bring Rosin in case she's watching tv but um <laughs> but it is it it seems to be the go-to story and like you just said, that's exactly what um, what people think. Of. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's why uh, God doesn't. Uh, you know, he doesn't create them that much. He, he destroyed two cities, and, and they all know that. You know, Lot's uh, wife turned to salt when she turned around, and, and that's that's the extent of the story. They don't always focus on the Ezekiel part of that. Well, actually, it's because you, were, you neglected those in need. Um, did anyone else have any comments that they wanted to make? Please feel free to talk if you want. There's no right or wrong comments, no right or wrong answers. David, can I jump in with a question? You can indeed. Hi guys, thanks so much for sharing your time today. Um, yeah, gosh, I mean, my, my heart breaks and I'm also pissed off hearing some of the stories. I'm just like, you know, how many more hundreds of years do we have to go through this? Like, really? <laughs> um, Look, a question for, for any of you, um, and it might put you on the spot a little bit, but um, so we, we as an organisation, we've had, um, like we've had a few national coordinators who have been op openly gay and a few members of our national executive who have been lesbian and so on, but we don't have anyone at the moment. Um, so my question is um, to you guys, how can we as an organisation, as a Christian organisation, be more inclusive? towards the LGBTIQ community? Um, and how can Christian organisations in general do better? Now, before you all answer that, uh, I, I want to point out that that was going to be the, the next part of our a discussion. But please answer now if, you, if, if, if you've got something really burning you want to say. <laughs> Sorry, David. No, no, that's all right. No, it's a, it's, it's a very good question. And, and we wanted to make sure that this was, that a big part of this discussion, you know, was about what can we do to, to make it more inclusive. But, but I'd love to hear from, you know, um, Jordi and, and, and Emily, if you'd like to share and uh, Rich. Well, I mean, David, we've had these discussions already before. Um, I think there's a lot of different aspects or different ways to approach it. But I do say like, the visibility and representation does matter. Um, so like basically ensuring that like, and I think from previous discussions, we've already talked about like how um, essentially there were churches that are willing to accept, but not willing to go the extra mile and affirm um, like people for who they are. Um, and I think specifically 
like it as a movement um and I know that David you obviously been doing a lot of work on this matter but continuing on to promote like messages of like support and well-being for the community um and continuing to essentially say like it's so important to um we support these communities no matter what um I think as well like there's like it's really a ensuring like there is a positive message out there and then condemning anything that's really needs to be condemned like having those stances always matter like as like an institution where like the church like widely as an institution there's obviously many churches um and we can't obviously um ensure every church is inclusive unfortunately but what we can do is always be willing to have the discussions or be willing to like ensure that churches are made aware that hey rather than having this approach you could have this approach that can actually affirm the identities of people you can actually um ensure that you are connecting with the community so give out when necessary so like obviously um like previous like yeah definitely like obviously there are services that the churches are willing to do to help support the community um or like community so for instance housing and homelessness being an issue and trying to support the homeless but like essentially like this is a big issue it's like there's religious organizations involved with these services that essentially are ongoingly discriminating against someone for who they are um, from accessing these vital services and I think basically as it's meant to be said is um, you're meant to welcome everyone with open arms you shouldn't really be essentially trying to discriminate or marginal like ensure people are marginalized for who they are you know um so like that broadly sums up it. there's a lot I could go into detail obviously um but yeah <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that uh Bridge did you want to add to that yeah I think that's um most of the stuff that I was kind of going to going to touch on um and yeah I'm like happy to talk about it a bit more as well um uh if we kind of get to get to the second section um but yeah I think just that like being really clear I think really helps um you know if you're if your community is inclusive of queer people of trans people um I think it's really important to make that as obvious as possible um sort of not like fearing kind of backlash I guess from people who may not fully share those beliefs because if there is that backlash there that's going to be a problem for those people who do engage with your community so I think it is just important to like make those kind of statements be really clear about the fact that you are an inclusive space if you are um and yeah trying to sort of again I think that that sort of importance of speaking out when there's kind of public issues that are affecting those members of your congregation um, rather than just sort of maintaining silence I think that can be really really helpful as well to sort of let people know that their community is there for them and is kind of taking a stand as much as possible on things that are negatively affecting them. Thank you for sharing that. Rose did you want to add something to that? No um, thanks guys looking forward to uh, the rest of the session. Well, thanks for that. Uh, and we certainly want to hear from um, Jordi and, and Bridget. You said there's a lot more that you, you want to say. So certainly we want to you know, hear, hear that, hear what you have to say. I want to make reference to a, another a verse in the Bible and also the kind of the, the debate around it, because it was something that Ros had mentioned about you know, how, many, how many centuries are we going to be having these, these debates. So in Leviticus, there is a verse that says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. And then we have a fellow called Matthew Vines, who was an author, and he wrote a book called God and the Gay Christian, the biblical case in support of same-sex relationships. Now, he has responded to this verse in Leviticus uh, and saying that it, it doesn't apply and then he has been criticized by uh, other Christians who say no no you're not reading it properly you're just you know picking what you want you're leaving things out and of course the response back is well you know you're doing the same same thing but um, he his response to that verse 
was Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law and the New Testament teaches that Christians should live under the new covenant rather than the old one. Consequently, this verse has never applied to Christians. For a man to lie with a man as with a woman violated the patriarchal gender norms of the ancient world, which is likely why Leviticus prohibited it. But the New Testament casts a vision of God's kingdom in which the hierarchy between men and women is overcome in Christ. So not only is Leviticus the, the prohibition uh, not applied to Christians, but the rationale behind it doesn't uh, extend to Christians either. Now, as I said, people criticised him for his arguments, and so it seems to go back and forth, uh, unfortunately. I just want to mention another one, and this is kind of similar to the why was Sodom and Gomorrah uh, destroyed. Uh, this is from um, the New Testament. Uh, Don't you realise that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery or who are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of your God. And again, there's a lot of things listed there, but people will focus on, in some cases, I've talked about homosexuality. I've also talked about a lot of other things, like not being greedy, not being a drunkard, and not cheating people, presumably in business and in, in just everyday life. But we kind of are very uh, selective. Uh, interestingly, a response to that verse uh, is as follows. The words translated as homosexuals and men who have sex with men more accurately translate to men who sleep with enslaved male prostitutes. The word homosexual is not found in the Bible in translations written prior to 1948, implying that it was likely added as a result of the translator's own prejudice. And again, in Timothy, it kind of again mentions a number of things that are no, no good. It talks about uh, you know, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. And again, people are, you know, are selective and they go, you know, it says you shouldn't do this. Yes, and it also says a whole range of other things as well. Did anyone have any comments on that before we go to the important discussion and how do we make the really important part of the discussion is how do we make the church more inclusive? Yeah, again, just really interesting and sort of nuance that doesn't often get talked about, I think. So really, really awesome to hear. Okay, thank you uh, for that um, bridge. So how do we make the church more inclusive? Now, we, we heard already uh, from um, Bridge and Geordie, and of course, want to love to hear from uh, the rest of you if, you, if you if you're comfortable sharing. I will just reference a few readings that are used by Christians who, who do want a more inclusive uh, church. So they will uh, mention that God welcomes people of all genders and sexual identities. Uh, and one of the verses that they use to, to uh, justify that is there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's from Galatians. Uh, and then there's also a part from Acts that says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And then makes reference to the fact that Jesus gladly socialized with people that the religious establishment disapproved of. Uh, and then there's some other parts that are used by inclusive Christians, such as the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free, but we have all been baptised into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. And that's again from Corinthians. Uh, and interestingly, people have made the argument that the early church welcomed non-gender conforming people one of the first recorded baptisms by the apostles was of an Ethiopian eunuch. And there is a debate around, there's debate around everything when it comes to Christianity and the Bible, but there's debate about whether they meant an, an actual eunuch or whether eunuch was a term for somebody who uh, was gay. And one of the uh, commentaries that I came across was 
Uh, the commentators generally suggest that the combination of a unit together with the title court official indicates a literal unit who would have been excluded from the temple by the restriction uh, mentioned in, in Deuteronomy. Some scholars point out that units were excluded from Jewish worship uh, and extend the New Testament's inclusion of these men to other sexual minorities, gay, um, as, as lesbian, etc. And then other people note that the term eunuch in the Bible has also been used in a non-literal sense, um, referring to uh, people who are gay, for example, and some commentators believe that uh, this person that was baptised was the first baptised gay Christian. And so I just thought I'd point uh, that out there as well. And then there's one more thing I just want to make a reference to. This comes from uh, Matthew um, chapter 18, verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And that's included by uh, some inclusive Christians because they then go on to say, if you consider that in the context of uh, how we've treated LGBTQI people, you know, if they've lost their faith because we have uh, driven them away, um, then we are breaching that, uh, that rule uh, not to make people stumble, not to uh, make people uh, leave um, the church, but we have uh, driven people uh, away. Now, enough from me. Uh, I'd love to hear more from uh, all of you. So how do we make the church uh, more inclusive? Even purely from a, 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 when you get to the church door, what do you want to see? Even, if, even before you get into the church, what does an affirming church literally look like? Anyone can answer that? Um, yeah, I think I was like watching watching a few videos and kind of doing a bit of reading um, in preparation for the session and came across a really, really good, um, like you can't ask that session um, with a bunch of um, like queer people of faith, specifically young people um, that was done by the Pride Trust or the Proud Trust. Um, yeah, the Proud Trust who are based in the UK. Um, and it was really interesting sort of asking, like one of the questions asked them, like what's a really awesome, like affirming experience that you've had within the church and asked them to talk a bit about that. And it seemed to overwhelmingly kind of come back to being able to find community um, and really having that need to like see a congregation where they're kind of represented. Um, there is that diversity, but most importantly, um, they kind of spoke to like this feeling of everyone there kind of looking out for each other, which I think is ideally what you want in a community in general, regardless of who it's made up of. Um, and yeah, just like one kind of line that really resonated with me, I think in particular was one person sort of going to a church that's really known for its inclusivity and its diversity and going there and sort of looking around at the other people there and thinking this is what a church should look like. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, I fully agree with that. I think it's just, yeah, like really, really important for people to sort of be able to find that community where there are other people like them there. And so there is a, a, a literal difference when you step foot into a church that is genuinely welcoming rather than one mm -hmm. that isn't. Yeah, yeah. Did anyone else want to share something, uh, Roz? Or which is the or, or Geordie, like what is an inclusive church? Not just on paper, but in, you know, I went to a church um, in Sydney and there's a sign out the front, a, a plaque that says this is a progressive church. And yeah. I went in there and I sat down and there was a lady next to me who I didn't know. And I said, oh, I hear that this is a progressive church. And she said, no, it isn't. And I'm thinking to myself, there's literally a plaque on the front of the door. <laughs> I didn't say that, but so what, what, for, for you, Jordi, what is an inclusive church? Like when you walk in the door, what is being said? What are you seeing? What are you hearing in an inclusive church? Yeah, well, as I've touched based on throughout the session, like I think visibility, representation really does matter. Um, so I know that there are like 
churches out there that actually fly like the rainbow pride flag and like the transgender flag for instance and openly have those like up when like on the platforms that they deliver speeches and everything so I think that really does send a message that saying oh you are welcome here um and like having that representation does matter um I think as well um with <laughs> sorry um speaking of messaging as well um I think like a lot of churches these days are using social media as a platform um and especially like in the last two years with the pandemic as well um obviously it's still ongoing but not as extreme as it was um or like that could be debatable actually but <laughs> um but I think like what Hap, what is great is sometimes there are churches out there that really use that platform to provide like a message of love and support and then also that essentially um use that to connect with like queer people who need that messaging um like so they try to ensure that they can have a discussion and try to make sure that they can connect with those who might need that sort of solid messaging out there so using that as a platform is a really great way um to stand up and just say yeah we're here or like talking about it um I know a church in South Australia which got brought to my attention um has been using TikTok and they said um that um their pastor is an openly um queer pastor um and they are using it as an opportunity to sort of promote those messages as to why they are an inclusive church um, and why they support individuals. So like really using those like um, sort of platforms or like really thinking outside of the box even a bit to try and make sure that people have that sort of visibility, that people sort of have the representation. It could even be like as, um, as many churches do they have their own like individual groups so they have a youth group they have like um young adults group for instance that sort of thing so they could even have like that sort of visibility and representation and just have a specific one relevant for queer people of faith you know like mm. just trying to have that as an opportunity for anyone who identifies within the community to connect with others in the community um and try to make sure it'd be like hey we've got this group um available they meet every so often. It would be great to have you to say if you like, or like having that promoted openly through the newsletters and the papers that um, churches tend to use as well to like basically say, oh, this is what today is about, et cetera. So, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. When you talk about messaging, I mean, there, there are literal billboards out the front of a lot of churches. And we were talking to uh, members of the Sikh community and they said, oh, what do you notice about churches when you're driving past? And they said, we always know something's going on on a Sunday because you tend to see more action. And we also notice the billboards. So clearly people are noticing and what's on there makes a difference. And I, I'm reminded of a, a story I read in the United, from the United States about a priest who put up on the billboard uh, Jesus had two dads as well, Joseph and God. Now, he got <laughs> criticised for that and had to take it down, and then he tried to say, oh, I, I, I wasn't talking about sort of, you know, gay relationships. I met stepdad and, you know, dad. And but people are like, no, I think you meant, the, um, you know, in support of a gay relationship, and that's great. But billboards certainly have power, uh, mm. what's on there or what isn't on there. And you also mentioned groups, and I think that's that's a really clear thing that churches can do if they have a group because people will go on the website and say you've got a youth group you've got this group you've got that group so i think that that can help uh bridge did you have anything you wanted to, to add to that side of things like what the messaging would look like yeah i think that's a really good point and um i kind of like i think just yeah any way that you can sort of get that sort of visible like you know rainbow like somewhere or some of that kind of message even if it is just as you're saying like on the door or somewhere um preferably in a way that people will affirm that then when you ask them about it once you once you get inside but um yeah like I give a lot of this like advice as well to sort of workplaces and like medical practices in particular who are sort of asking how can we make it really clear that we're inclusive mm -hmm. and it's the same sort of thing like even just sort of having those little like 
stickers on your door or in your like email signature or something can make a really big difference like it's so you know it's obviously important to sort of back that up with you know being actually inclusive but sort of being able to like have that sort of indicator for people that this is somewhere that somewhere that they're safe um i think is yeah really important yeah and we talked earlier about the kind of you know the you know, will be nice to you but we don't really accept you and i and i think i, I keep thinking of uh, people i've met in the church um, and this is in relation to women priests and, you know, I'll meet a priest who is very nice. He's very nice to me. But then he'll say these comments about Penny Wong and about women who are lesbian. And, and you think, that, but there's, I always hear people say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so is nice. And so, yes, but that, that's not enough just to say somebody is nice. Um, it depends on what they believe. And, you know, there's a, a priest at another church who will not give communion to female priests. And, but he's a nice guy. You chat to him, he's a nice guy. And you go, but that doesn't matter because it, it, there's, a, there's a bigger issue here. So it's got to be, like you said, genuine. What about when you're at the church and you're hearing the sermons? What, what would you hear at an inclusive church? And what came to mind was with anti-Semitism, you know, Christianity unfortunately has contributed to quite a lot of anti-Semitism. You know, you've killed, the Jews killed Jesus. It's their fault, you know, and there's been a lot of examples in history and in, and, and in the present of, of, of Christians fueling uh, anti-Semitism and one thing that people said you have to do is there's a reading in the Bible that talks about when Jesus is getting uh, just before he gets crucified the the, the, the Jews um, uh, you know the, will accept responsibility the blood is on our hands and people say see see they've accepted that all Jewish people throughout history are responsible for um, Jesus being uh, being killed and so people are saying what you should do is when you do that reading give that context and say this doesn't actually mean that all Jews, you know, are responsible. It doesn't mean you can justify anti-Semitism. So from what we're talking about today, what do you need to hear from the pulpit? What would, what would you hear at an inclusive church? I think just kind of like similarly to the sort of, like the sort of spin that you were kind of putting on some of the verses before that I think it is really important as well to sort of acknowledge um, areas of the Bible or areas of scripture or like teachings within churches that um, have like traditionally been used in a sort of way to like divide or to sort of exclude people. Um, I think it can be really valuable to have those discussions too, but sort of having it through that lens of this is one way that it has been interpreted in the past here's you know other people's interpretations of it and really sort of like tying back to the fact that what people get out of that kind of teaching can really vary and it's really important to sort of keep that in mind um i think just sort of like approaching things through that kind of lens is really valuable and something that i would see in a progressive church mm -hmm. jordy did you want to add to that yeah, no, I think just in general with the messaging, like, I mean, every pastor has their own interpretation of messaging, obviously. Um, I think just in general, like, I think when they're approaching it, like, they can always go approach a particular message and just say, this applies to everyone or this applies to, like, this case. So, like, um, so, for instance, God says uh, to love thy like love your enemy as like as the neighbor you know that sort of thing um i like even and i think taking into context of that being like well if you might not necessarily agree with someone's relationship um with uh like a same-sex relationship for instance but necessarily you shouldn't discriminate against that individual you should accept them for who they are you know you should be there to be like there to support them um and be like and matter of fact is, is you don't discriminate against them so like yeah like there's always just like going that general approach where um really just taking into the context to be inclusive of everyone um rather than just being like specific groups and as you mentioned like um yeah sure like um 
Jews. Essentially, the Jews did kill Jesus, but I think people forget as well, Jesus was a Jew. Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, like he actually was a, like a person of Jewish faith. And essentially, people forget that sort of idea or notion saying, oh, like he started this, but like, matter of fact, it's just like, um, he, um, like, it's also just making sure people recognize the identities of individuals and not forgetting or, or like making sure not only half the page is read, making sure the full page is read and that oh. sort of thing. So, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and that, 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 that happens a lot, isn't it? That we kind of, the person is no longer an individual, it's a group, you represent that group. Now I'm mindful of the time, so I, I will we'll call it, we'll, this will be the close, but did anyone have any other sort of questions they wanted to put out or statements? Nope, that's so, oh, you, Ross, yes. Just wanted to say a huge thank you for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. Indeed, I want to echo that. Thank you so much uh, for joining. Look, it, it's a great thing to be able to come together to, to hopefully do something good. Um, so I really do appreciate all of you and Ros joining us and, and, and Emily and um, those that are watching, if you have any, when, when you do watch this, if you have any questions or, you know, please get in contact with us and we're happy to sort of forward on questions to, to Bridge and Geordie and, and this has been a joint, um, jointly hosted uh, between uh, two groups and we're so grateful that you guys, did, uh, that all of you joined and for those of you that may watch. So thank you again and I'll let you all go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.